everyone, and welcome to Live from the Lab. This is the show where we talk about different technologies that Brookers developed to help scientists discover the world around us. Today's topic is measuring modulated structures using single crystal X-ray diffraction. Now, what is a modulated structure? We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Yeah, basically, what we're talking about is instead of having that perfect symmetrical unit cell repeated over and over again, yeah, sometimes things get a little bit fuzzy. So to learn more, though, what we're going to do is we're going to head on over and talk to some experts. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for having us. So today we're joined by Ashley and Michael from our single crystal group. So now modulated structures. Why? Like what makes a modulated structure different than a normal structure? Right. So if you think about, um, you know, this, these are little water molecules in their crystalline form. So solid water, ice. If you take this structure and you extend it for about a meter and then you imagine walking across it, right? Every step you'll have a depression and where there isn't a step it will be that same height. And that step will kind of be at a regular interval but you're breaking that translational symmetry. So we need another way to describe that repeating pattern, another dimension or Q vector to describe that structure and that almost wave-like function of the changes in that uh, structure. So the modulations, that's this deviation that is occurring. Yes. Now on what order is this typically? I mean, if we say there's a one unit cell distance, is this like every five unit cells, 10, 100? Yeah, it can, it varies on the mm -hmm. structure and you know, whether or not that repeating amount um, is an integer or not will also change the way that you go about uh, solving that structure. Oh, okay. So it could actually be something like an interstitial or substitutional defect in the structure? No, I think that would be really something different. I mean, there's different um, um, kinds of modulation. Okay. There's positional modulation. Yep. This is what I actually just talked about. But then you could also have uh, occupational. Mm -hmm. So in, in, you know, there's a modulation wave uh, running over the structure where sometimes it's a manganese and, and sometimes it's a calcium okay. and some mineral, uh, for example, that could be the case. Okay, so a substitutional defect you might, you would see if it's on an ordered, kind of long-ranged order yeah. piece. Uh, now what about lattice vibrations? Would that also be an example? Um, that would be a smaller um, and separate from um, this modulation. And you can also decrease those, uh, well, the thermal movement at least by measuring at lower mm -hmm. temperature as well. Okay. So uh, in order to learn more about this, I guess, Michael, you've put together a few slides, right? I did. All and, right. Uh, and we'll be sharing these now. All right. Let's. So here's uh, just a, a short intro in what we will look at, um, just really quickly about modulation. Um, we'll talk about satellite reflections. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Q vectors in superspace. This is what we will need to describe this in, in higher dimensions. Uh, we'll look at an average structure and maybe superstructures. Um, and then um, what we will do is we will use Apex 5 um, to do a demo uh, to determine the Q vectors uh, to, to um, uh, index in a, in a um, higher dimension and then uh, do integration and scaling. I will just touch on those and, and show what's different. And then um, it's covered by the video feed, but um, we'll then um, also show how you can prepare files to use uh, YANA uh, 2020. This is the program you will need to really properly describe the structure in a higher dimension. Uh, we'll right. not really go into this. There's, there won't be enough time to do this. Maybe at a later. That's okay. right. We can always do another four. episode. Season four. Season yes. four. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, by the way, if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and type those in right now on the side uh, of your screen. Uh, we'll get to those. So, we talked about uh, translational symmetry, and this, this is like um, just an example of what you would um, see in a, in a regular um, 3D structure. Uh, just a molecule that repeats itself over and over. So here in, in, in two dimensions, and we all know how a diffraction pattern looks like. Uh, very simplified, of, of course. So you have uh, also translational symmetry um, in that structure. You see the, when you look at these lines that go through these uh, columns, they have all the same distance. So you repeat that over and over. So for those who may not be as familiar with that idea of reciprocal space, what we're looking at, the red dots do not represent the individual unit cells right? Mm, they do not, 
but then you use their position to index and determine the yep. unit cell. Yep. So each spot, it's more the positioning of the spots and the arrangement. That's more about the overall symmetry that we see between unit cells. Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, this is what I actually talked about. Just imagine you have these depressions here. This is where uh, somebody walked all over that structure. Okay. And um, you, you can put in a, you see, you can put in a, 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 a wave function that describes this. And the interesting thing is when you look at this, um, it, it, it's not an integer um, of, of the repetition. Um, count to like six, seven, you're almost at the same spot, then go to 13 and you're almost, you're not really there. Yeah. So you see it's not just a, uh, an integer uh, or um, it, it's really like a, an incommensurate number, uh, basically, the relationship between those two. Um, but it is something that, that does repeat. It's not a random interval. It's, no. it's a repeating interval. It's, it's a long-range order. Okay. And the long-range order actually destroys the short-range order, at least in this direction, because now you yeah. see you don't have translational symmetry anymore. Um, if you go along the rows yeah. in the columns, you would still have. Mm -hmm. um, worst case scenario is you could have a modulation there too. Now could you have it where, say, like the second row was actually, say, shifted um, out of phase with that? Right, so so the top one say dips down, the other one dips up at the same point. Would that still be called a, a modulated structure, or do they um, all have to deviate in the same direction? The same. I guess if you would uh, introduce like a, a second modulation yeah. uh, function in the columns, this is exactly what would happen. Okay. So uh, a diffraction pattern then looks different. You get these additional spots, and, and those mm -hmm. are called satellites. Um, you see little planets and moons. Um, I guess. Um, so the, these satellites, you can imagine, they, they just, um, their, their origin um, is, is really at the point of, of the main uh, reflection. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reflections themselves, they're not really smaller. Uh, I just use that to, to show that they typically have a lower intensity. So we use these lines to make it maybe a little more visible. Um, now you see this, this pattern where you have lost translational uh, symmetry. So the distances between these individual uh, reflections in the, in the rows is now uh, is, is, is not the same. So we have lost uh, uh, translational symmetry. Um, what we need to do now uh, to regain that uh, uh, symmetry, we have to go to a higher dimension. We have to introduce another dimension. Um, and that's what is, is used to uh, do that. Here's an example. Um, where you have a, um, um, a Q vector or satellites uh, that have um, a contribution from two uh, cell edges, A and B. They don't have to really uh, run along uh, one uh, direction of a unit cell. Okay, so in this example then, that real space picture you had before, the waves were all going one way. Here we'd have them going one way, but also we'd see a wave going the other way too. Yeah. All right. So. What happens if we uh, pretend we didn't see that, those satellites? And, and this happens a yeah. lot in the... Filter them out, right? Yeah. Just get yeah. rid of them. I mean, you just, um, either <laughs> you have older instrumentation, you don't see them, or um, sometimes the, the, the software is so good it will just index mm -hmm. and then you, you don't see that. You get the idea now that you average all these positions, uh, just push them all together, then this is what you get um, um, as an average structure. And then you, you get, um, you know, this little molecule will have typically bad thermal ellipsoids. The geometry will be bad. It just looks like a, an ugly giraffe. That's what I, I thought yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's kind of interesting about that is, like you mentioned, thermal ellipsoids. This actually looks like it's a thermal vibration just in the one direction, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's look at a little bit uh, about these, a um, little bit deeper in, into these main reflections in the satellites. So here. Uh, just zoomed in and when you look at the distance um, of the main reflection so that's one unit and then you see uh, the distance to the first satellite that's in this case it's about 0.29 um, and um, where's my mouse? so we define this as, as a Q vector so um, we basically can now describe um, all these reflections with one additional vector. So that's our next dimension. So in this case, it would be 3D plus 1. 
And so the, the vector to the other side from that main reflection, that would be a negative Q. And for everybody out there, Q, that's just, uh, we're denoting that that's a, a vector in this reciprocal or diffraction yep. space. Mm -hmm. It's not in the real space. Exactly. Okay. And um, so things can get a, actually a little um, a worse. Um, we can have, depending on the structure, we can have um, more satellites, and that's called the order of a satellite. So if we have a, a strong modulation, um, we often see second order satellites, mm -hmm. and then it gets a little tricky to uh, determine the Q vector. So now you have a satellite, and it has little satellite, but that satellite does not belong to that satellite. So when you, when you say first order, second order, this is how this looks like. Now look at the arrows. Mm -hmm. um, you see, although it's really close to Q, this is actually a satellite negative 2Q uh, from the neighboring reflection, okay? So now what we can do is with one additional uh, Q vector, we can describe or index all these reflections. So if um, the first um, large reflection, the main reflections, uh, reflection on the left would have been 110, now we can um, add another dimension. Um, it's 1100, zero, zero. and then you see uh, that first uh, satellite is now 1101, one. the second one is 1102, one, and then you also have negatives and, and so on. So it's actually really elegant that with one additional dimension, one Q vector, you can now um, describe um, the, uh, the structure. Um, so here's an example. Um, when we introduce this new format, it's called an HKLF6 uh, format where we now have uh, more indices. So we have you know, HKL and then MNO, um, which means we just have uh, positions for three um, additional vectors. Okay. So in our case, we only have one um, satellite and then we have uh, second order satellites. That's why we have in the fourth column, we have zeros for the main reflections and one and twos and negatives for the, um, the other reflections. Okay, so we have HKL, that's the mm -hmm. position of the main, mm -hmm. and then the, the last three are to talk about if it's a satellite relative to that main, yeah. and the positioning of that in the reciprocal space. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, is that all the number? One, two, three, four, five, six. And we have another one, L. a last one. That's the intensity? That's intensity and okay. sigma. All mm -hmm. right, all right. Okay, so this is, this is a, uh, people are very used to an HKL4 format file, yep. that's a regular HKL intensity, uh -huh. and then uh, sigma of the intensity. And this is a, a higher dimensional okay. data set. Okay. So um, what we will do now uh, in APEX, um, we will look at an example of a modulated structure. It's this morpholin uh, car carbothiol um, um It's actually um, an antimicrobial uh, compound. It can be purchased. Really? And I <laughs> ran across this in a, in a basic training. That's the first um, uh, compound I mounted for these people, and it's a modulated structure. They were very confused. Yeah. It's, a, I mean, yeah, it, it's a very, very long, kind of scary name. Yep. <laughs> I guess so, a lot of organic. So are, it's, right? it's, it's even more scary because uh, the, the structure, it's not scary, but the structure was actually published twice in 2007 yeah. and 2021. Mm -hmm. And um, I won't name any names. So it was uh, uh, published as the average structure. And we will now see what kind of problems that causes if you ignore uh, the satellites. So is this one of those materials that you um, put on the little tip and then you have to like freeze it to create the crystal or does it create its crystals on its own? No, you, you, you crystallize that. Okay, you crystallize it. You crystallize it and you of course use crystallization to uh, purify okay. samples. So often when we buy, um, because we don't make any uh -huh. you know, compounds in the, in the lab here, and we don't like to recrystallize either, so we're kind of lazy. We'll buy very um, uh, pure compounds at Aldrich or Sigma, and then um, often we just we can use them out of the bottle. Okay, yeah. so at room temperature, this is a, a crystal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what's kind of interesting then is, uh, so you're saying that the modulation is actually induced as a, a fundamental property of the material. It's not something that is induced because of external yep. things. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, okay. Interesting. So. Here you see a structure. Um, when I um, determine the structure as an average structure, you mm -hmm. see the problems, these large thermal ellipsoids, and, and some atoms look kind of fine, and, and um, others have 
that just look really bad. So that's I, the stretching out kind yep. of that we're seeing. Yeah, the wide and the flat and the really long. Yeah. It, normally, if you see this, you would think, oh, this maybe it was collected at room temperature, a little hot, and that's mm -hmm. a lot of thermal motion, but that's not the case here. Okay. Okay. So, and I, I think this is when we switch to Apex. And, um, All right. So um, now in terms of data collection, Ashley, yeah. so do you need any special requirements on your machine in order to do this type of analysis? Um, you know, what we recommend is just a very bright source mm -hmm. and, you know, nicer, newer detectors, stronger detectors that really helps you to be able to see those lower intensity satellite reflections. All right. So, and then in terms of intensities of sources, I know there's like, you know, classic sealed tubes. Then we've got like the rotating anodes. Now we have this new class of microfocuses that are extremely bright. Yes. And then we have the, uh, the metal jets. Right. Where would you be comfortable in recommending somebody if they, um, this is the type of work they want to do? If most of the time an IMUS 3 or above is fabulous and it's great and you'll be able to see these satellites, sometimes um, they're so low in intensity that you might need the Diamond 2s or you might may even need the Metal Jet. But usually at that point you're already working with materials yeah. where you need that extra intensity. And then in terms of detection, I know that Michael was talking about how it's really important you can decouple these from the background, right? right. These satellite peaks. What kind of detector would you recommend here? Um, I will always recommend the Photon 3 detectors. Okay. So is it like the size too? I know there's different sizes of these. Yeah, um, the size of the detector right now, I mean our detectors are pretty great. The C and M7s are mm -hmm. fabulous. Or 14s honestly are ideal for this and it just depends on the spread of your diffraction pattern on what is best for you and also the source that you're using. All right. Now in terms of positioning that detector closer or farther away, What's more important here? Is it getting the most intensity, putting that thing close, or is it better to move it back, get better resolution to resolve the satellite piece? It's a delicate dance between the two, yeah. and um, as long as you, finding that right spot of being able to separate those two reflections from mm -hmm. each other is most important, and that will depend on your material, your unit cell, and then also your, um, your source, so if you're using molybdenum or copper or silver. So which of those would you recommend? Um, that would depend on the materials that you're working okay. with, okay. Um, but you know, if you have the satellite reflections that are very, very close to that yeah. main reflection, then you may need to go to copper just to spread out your diffraction pattern a little bit. All right. Now, in terms of data collection time, is this something you should take a really long, like, how long would a typical data set take? Um, how long was this one? Um, it's copper. I collected pretty um, uh, Good redundancy, I, I don't know, short exposure times, I, a couple of hours. Okay, yeah. a couple um, of hours. Oh, well, that's pretty good. I mean, I guess I was imagining you're going to say maybe a few days, especially if no, we're no, capturing no. these tiny little satellites. Okay. No. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Things have come then, I guess, a long way in the lab. Yes. Yep. All right. So um, I think we're going to see now some software from Michael. What do we do once we get that data? So um, what we see here is a, um, I already started Apex 5. You see the um, uh, diffraction pattern. Mm -hmm. I, I will just play a movie and of, of this diffraction pattern. I was collected on, on copper. When you look at this, you have uh, low background, <clears throat> sharp spots. And when I saw this first, you know, there's no indication that this is um, a modulated structure. There's yeah. nothing that really scares you right away. Um, we have good separation of spots. We have good intensity. Mm -hmm. So I was expecting, oh, this will be an, an, an easy structure to do. Um, in the, in the next step, what we do is we, what we call harvest uh, these spots. You see these spots, um, we will uh, determine their position and we will determine their uh, intensity and write them into an array. I've done this, I have uh, about uh, 2,700 reflections and I will start um, our lat. Uh, that's our reciprocal space viewer. You see I, I have sort of a little uh, donut um, of, of data here. And if you're uh, familiar with how, you know, um, data sets look like in reciprocal space, uh, you, you, you can see pretty quickly that there's something um, funny going on. And, and when you look at this, uh, this structure here, you see you have these, these lines here, they seem to be denser. And then you have these pairs of, of, of lines, of, of lattice lines. Um, and with a little a bit of experience, um, you, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, this is not a regular 
structure, I will rotate this um, so that I, I can look at the histogram over here. And you can see that, that these uh, lines here that are a little denser, they're also um, stronger. And let's maybe make that a little clearer. It, it looks very, very similar to your uh, illustration you had before, but now we're looking in 3D. So I guess it adds that exactly. to it. Yeah. Yeah. So you see now strong, super weak, weak, yeah. weak, super weak, strong. So we, we have this pattern. Um, we see actually that, that there's some sort of a modulation running over this. And um, so we can go back and, and index this and, and see what happens. Um, but just keep in mind, you know, it, it really looks like there, there's some modulation and it's not just a, a simple 3D structure. So we go back here. Now the fact that you do have though a mixture of, of brighter and weaker that's not 100% that it's modulated, right? No. Okay. It's yep. not. But yeah, it's, it's like you said, when it's you look a lot your, of indications. Yeah, when you, you, you look get, with your trained eye, yeah. once you've seen a bunch yeah. of these. Kind of so when we index this, and I, um, most of you will be familiar with the software. There's nothing special I'm doing right now. I'm just indexing. And uh, you see here, I get a really good solution with like a, a unit cell about 6,000 uh, cubic angstroms, 11, 22, 25. We'll just accept that. Um, We'll refine it once, accept it, we'll do a Brave check. Uh, it's monoclinic P. Everything looks really nice. And this is where like people, you know, mm -hmm. might just go on and continue um, and maybe not get the, the best solution uh, um, possible. <clears throat> so what I can do now is I can press F1, um, I hope, and then we will look along A star. And I will zoom in a little. So what you see now is that we have determined a unit cell, mm -hmm. and it will um, probably cover uh, you know, all of the reflections. I've just put a grid on, and, and actually it's a good fit. But um, the, the big problem we have is there's no reflections you know, on this, this row here. So the software predicts now there should be reflections. So it, it sort of picks this unit cell from here to here to here, but there's nothing to here. There is a row of reflection, there's nothing. So, and this is, when we come back, uh, maybe, you know, the next best description, maybe a, a super uh, space uh, description of, of the problem. But um, in order to describe this uh, correctly, again, what we need to do is we need to find the main reflection. Okay. If you only look at the main reflections, we will get this messed up average structure. But if you have the main structure, then um, in reciprocal space, we can then determine the Q vectors. So the first, the first thing we will do is we will determine the, um, uh, the main lattice. So in your, in your F6 format, HKL F6 format, this would be nail those first HKL, those yeah. first three. Mm -hmm. okay. And then um, that half in, in the other positions, uh, zeros. So what I do is I use this lattice overlay tool, and then um, I will add uh, more lines. And I will add more planes to the outside. Now, what you see is I'm only uh, selecting the strong reflections. You see, I'm, not, I'm ignoring these pairs here. Yes. So what I will do is um, I will invert the selection because I want to keep them um, in, the, in the gray ones. Oh, we could actually, yeah, let's do that. And then we put these in a different group. Before all the reflections were in the gray group, now we put the strongest one, the main reflections into the green group. Uh, no, we're putting the weaker reflections in the... In the in, yes, we put the weaker reflections, thank you, in the, <laughs> in the green group. Um, and so when I turn this off, you see now um, we have um, a, a, a structure. Um, and when we turn off, the green ones, these are the reflections now for the, uh, the average structure. So that would be the HKLs um, yes. are the regular, and then mm -hmm. zeros for MNO in this yep. group. So right. the, the, the people who uh, determine the structures and publish them, they only focused on these. Yes. And then you get the average structure. Mm -hmm. So we can go back um, to determine unit cell and be indexed again, and um, now we uh, use the gray reflections and we put them into the green um, uh, unit cell. And now we will get a different unit cell. It's 5, 11, 20. 
and you see it has a, a unit cell volume that's about a fifth, okay? So let me accept that. And then what we will do is, um, let me refine it once, we accept, we do a Brave check, it's also monoclinic. And in terms of that size, now the size you said got smaller, and that's reflected in the reciprocal space being bigger. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Yes. That's why it's reciprocal. That's right. Yep. <laughs> so now we, 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 we have, um, you know, the, the unit cell. F1 looks along A star, F2 along B star, F3 along C star. Looks all fine. We turn on the green ones, and now they sit in between again. All right. So now we, we use um, a, a really cool trick. Um, unfortunately, you know, I didn't come up with that. Um, this is um, Bay Index. This is Sander uh, von Smann um, in, uh, in Bayreuth, who wrote a, a program to index incommensurates. And basically what he proposed is to now collapse all the reflections um, by reducing um, uh, dimensions. So now we're um, getting rid of three dimensions which means that all the, the, the reflections that are indexed, the main reflections, they will collapse into one position. Okay. And then we have the green ones are left over. And you will see what happened uh, to the, the green reflections. To do this, um, we go into the view. We turn on periodic. And then we want to have um, the center at the origin. So we're working off this um, larger or the, the smaller unit cell, larger in reciprocal space, every, all the reflections that are um, indexed now collapse into the, the center. Okay. And we have these two groups of, of reflections because all the satellites now collapse too into Q and negative Q. So this is super elegant. Uh -huh. um, and uh, uh, we did this in the early 2000s. I, I thought it was a big deal that they were able, the software developers were able to, to program this. Um, it looks really slick. So now what we do is we determine the, the Q vector. We go to the Q vector tab, and um, we say we want to have a new Q vector. And the first thing I do is I, I click on this cloud, and then um, I will go into a, a, a different orientation, and I'm not sure, it's a little faint, you see, we're slightly off. Mm -hmm. I will click on the cloud again. And now, um, you know, when we rotate this, you see, we, we hit this really nicely. And um, we have a Q vector here that's about 0.391, uh, 0, and 0.156. These will be refined later anyway, uh, but this is a really good start. I will turn this uh, into 0. Now, in this folding, if you had a second order satellite, would you actually see then like yep. the spots going out farther? So you, you see this here. Yeah. These, are, these are sort of good candidates. How, how would we see this? We go back to view, and I say we, we pack the cells now. And um, when we go back to Q vectors, we turn on a second order satellites. And then. Um, it's really faint. I'm not sure whether you can see that even, but there is some faint um, repetition of these reflections. And yeah, uh, yeah, I do see you, those. You see this? Yeah, you have to. So look these really are really close. second mm -hmm. order yep. uh, satellites. Yep. Okay. Wow. So now we have determined this, and um, um, the the one change you will see in the unit cell we have now a Q M. So we have one Q vector, and when we go here and edit then we see we have a modulation here, and that's our Q vector. Um, we can refine this here, and we, it will also be refined during integration. Um, I will jump right into uh, data integration. I will just show you um, what needs to be done, not much. Um, yes. Reduce data, integrate. We have to make sure that we use the uh, right unit cell with the Q vectors. And then um, the only thing uh, that you might um, want to look at, integration options, more options. You see down here, uh, you can um, determine the maximum order of satellites. In this case, I, I integrated two orders, but they're very weak. Um, 
So I probably wouldn't do this again. The software is, is very transparent. Although it says raw file, it will write a RAM file okay. for modulation uh, in that uh, format you know, where you have HKL, M, N, O, uh, N, N, O, R, M, T at this point. Scaling. Um, so uh, in this case, what actually happens is the satellites will break the symmetry. Mm -hmm. You need to know that. It's not like often straightforward. So in this case, you have to integrate this as triclinic because later this will be a triclinic superspace group. Um, the important thing is that you um, load the RAM file. You see that RAM? Yep. It's, a, it's a different. And then also what you do is you go to the advanced setup. If you leave it as an unmerged HKL file, it will actually only extract the average structure. But then you can change this to um, HKL6 modulated structures only, and I typically change this to HK6, just to be not confused. Yeah. That's yeah. all you have to do, everything is super transparent. So um, when we look at the structures now, um, when we look at the structures, and we refine the, we, we refine the average structure, then you see we have these problems. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a 10% structure. Um, you probably, you know, could fudge that a little and make it look a little better, but you never get rid of the thermal ellipsoid. So is it that like that that thermal ellipsoid is really so elongated? Yes. It's like it should be more uniform, right? Yeah. If it's yes. It should be it a should. nice round ball. Yeah. You know, this one, like like the end here. Yeah. So when you when you look at uh, you know the modulation uh, functions, this probably doesn't have a, a large modulation function. These here will have a large one. So now we're going back. Remember when when I indexed that that unit cell in the beginning that yes. didn't fit, it's five. So five, um, remember the Q vector was about 0 0.4. Yeah. In order to hit that by you know, making the unit cell larger, we have to go to 0 0.2 to be able to hit the 0 0.4. Yeah. 0 0.2 will be missing. But um, I, I integrated this with the, you know, that superstructure, and um, then it's P21, we lose yeah. the, um, the glide plane, and um, so this is how the structure looks like then, and you also will then uh, get an idea why the why the thermal ellipsoids are so large. So this looks already much better. It, it's not perfect. You see, some of them are still mm -hmm. bad, but sort of when you look at the projection of this, you know, you would ex you would expect that they line up really nicely. Do you see what kind of a mess this is down here? Maybe maybe you can even see it a little better here. You have all these different, um, let's look at this. You know. Yeah, I mean the biggest difference I see is in that, that blue, the blue ball. So that blue ball is now kind of more of a sphere. Yeah, um, here, all right, this is not, that should yeah. be carbon here, but do you, do you see the, you know, the, the yep. six-membered ring here, the, the benzamide, you know, this is really flopping yeah. uh, back and forth. So this is, you know, the, the next be best thing, mm -hmm. but really to be able to um, de determine this correctly, you have to take then this HKL6 format file and go into YANA okay. and uh, really determine the structure. Unfortunately, uh, you, traditionally, uh, when you determine a higher dimensional uh, structure, what you will get is um, an atomic modulation function. Yeah. So you, you just get sine curves and combination, yeah, it looks yeah, actually yeah. Um, uh, uh, pretty boring. And um, the, the thing really is that um, um, it's, it's difficult to imagine where the atoms are in, a, in, in, a, in superspace, because we had only talked about superspace in reciprocal space. Yeah. Where are the atoms in, in real space? And it's, it's basically um, what you're looking at, you're looking at, at a cut through a 3D plus one um, dimension, sort of a projection. Um, imagine a sphere interacting, a three-dimensional sphere interacting with a two-dimensional world. All you would see is a circle. Depending on where you look, the circle gets bigger or smaller. Yeah, yeah. Sort of the same, maybe. Um, so the atoms really, uh, they're, they're not... In, in higher dimension, they're, they're not uh, uh, points. You really have to uh, understand them as, as um, 
one-dimensional atomic domains, and, and they they are on they actually um, are in the fourth dimension on the curve, which is called the the atomic modulation yeah. uh, function. Yeah. So what people have done, and, and that's really cool, is um, so this modulation function, you know, the period is on a on a axis that's called t. Now you take this axis and you put this into the time domain, and you, you pretend you're just moving along uh, this axis and do this for all uh, atoms. Yep. And then you can make these movies. The molecules are not moving in the in the structure, but these are all the different positions. And if you make the steps in t small enough, you get an idea how these are uh, flopping around. And and you see that's the the um, uh, especially the the benzamides, you know, they're flopping a lot. Um, and this is why uh, the thermal ellipsoids, when you use the average structure, why that is so bad. All right. So basically, uh, my understanding then would be this is kind of like the old stop motion animation, yep. right? So you, what we're seeing is an animation, total animation. But really, in the unit cell, we're just kind of moving along the the modulation axis. Mm -hmm. and we're just saying one is stuck like this, one is a little turned, one is a little turned, yep. one is a little turned. It's not saying that it's moving in real time mm -hmm. like this. But it looks cool. Yeah, it just represents <laughs> where yep. that, as how that twisting motion does yep. occur along the modulation yep. axis. All right, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty cool. And again, the other thing that really I, I see here now is that all those spots, they got much smaller, right? Yep. Now, would you recommend that you collect a data set like this at really low temperature so that you can reduce any thermal? So in conventional structures, um, they often the the the, uh, the strength of the satellite or the intensity changes with temperature. Okay. Often, what you can do is if you have a modulated structure, an incommensurate structure, um, and you typically collect it at low temp, raise the temperature, you will have larger thermal ellipsoids because you have more vibration. But often, the um, modulation disappears. At higher temperature? At, at higher temperature, yes. Okay, because mm -hmm. just things are generally wiggling yeah, more than the modulation. Yeah, it's some sort of a, I'm not sure whether you would call this a tra uh, phase transition. Yeah. Sometimes there, there, there's actually a certain temperature yeah. when it turns modulated or incommensurate. All right. So sometimes um, sometimes the it helps to raise the temperature, which, which is counterintuitive. In this case, it was actually, we collected, the, the first data set I collected uh, um, on this uh, was actually at room temperature, so it's also modulated at room temperature. So, so if you want to kind of reduce the modulation effect, collect at elevated temperature or at room temperature. Yep. If you want to enhance it, really bring out that modulation, cool it down. Yeah, I. That's my experience. I'm not sure whether it's always yeah. the case, but that's, oh yeah, that's always my, depends yeah. on the material yeah. itself, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe even collect at both temperatures. Yes, yeah, that's typically what you do. All right. Um, so we've got some questions that have come in, and if anybody else has any questions right now, go ahead and type them into YouTube. Otherwise, if you're watching this later, uh, go ahead, send it to live.events at broker.com, and we will get a response back to you. So uh, a few questions that have come in. We have some before that have actually come in before the broadcast and during. Um, so first of all, there is a shout out to Michael Roof from Kuldeep Mahia. Thank you. So, <laughs> hello, Michael Roof there. Um, next from uh, Matt McFly, it would be great to have a tutorial data set that can be downloaded and looked at in Apex software to look at these structures and learn more. Is that something we have or they could reach out maybe and get? Yeah. Um, I, I had this request before um, from somebody else. I will package the, um, we'll package the, the data and then I guess we can post it on YouTube. I, I don't know. So yeah. uh, we'll make this available. OK. Yeah. So uh, next from uh, Moises Bravo, in integration with a Q vector, should I skip my fast scans? Um, it, it, really, it really depends whether, you know, often, often with these um, modulated structures, the problem is that you need a very, very high dynamic range because yeah. they can be very weak. And you have to also look at the very strong reflections. So there, there's no reason to um, skip the fast scan. Okay. Um, but if you if you have, you know, you will spend more quality time with a, a material like this. You will not typically just collect one data set, um, and maybe you can optimize uh, the uh, the exposure time. Often, what I what I do is I will collect. 
sort of two data sets that I, I merge, like a very long uh, exposure to really enhance the, uh, the quality of the satellites, and then a regular data set that really focuses more on the, on the main reflections. Um, so in terms of the, that dynamic range you mentioned, what are we talking here intensity differential between that main principal reflection and then the related satellite? Factor of 5, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, million? Uh, first thing that popped into my mind is just like at least 1,000, maybe 10,000. Okay. So quite, yeah. quite different in terms yeah. of the intensities. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Next question from Justin. Can I download Apex 5 software? You can absolutely download the Apex 5 software. Um, if you have a Bruker instrument, go ahead and log in with your serial number into brukersupport.com, and you can download that there. Um, you can also reach out for a demo license if you're interested in that as well. All right. Uh, next question from Taylor. Can Apex 5 read other frame formats? Well, I don't know why. I mean, you have this beautiful Bruker machine that's putting out. Um, nice we can frame. read um, a lot of synchrotron data sets. Okay. There's some ways that you can um, change the format to something that is compatible with Apex, but there's um, some limitation to that. Yeah, so most, most of the synchrotrons, um, basically everything that can write a CBF file, uh, that's sort of the mm -hmm. general exchange format, and most synchrotrons will do that because most synchrotrons use dextrose detectors. So. So in yes. terms, of, since you mentioned a beamline, if you're doing this kind of work and you're going to say publish that structure with the modulation in it and such, is it something that you, that a lab system that quality is sufficient, or is it something where the lab gives you the the indication? Now I should go to the beamline and collect the data set to finally publish. Certainly, um, I mean what what we see with the stronger sources that a lot of um, services that previously had collected you know smaller samples, weaker samples and then went to the synchrotron. With the stronger sources, this has sort of gone away a little. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of people do you know, all of their work uh, in the home lab, and that's certainly possible today with uh, very strong sources. All right, so as long as you have one of those newer strong sources, you should feel comfortable submitting that, that paper, that data, and that your yep. reviewer is not going to come back and say, no, you got to go to Beamline, come on. Okay, okay. Nope. so lab systems are good for now. Um, Next question uh, from uh, York Daniels. Will you tell me something about composites? We can do composite structures uh, too, um, but it's not readily supported in Apex 5. The um, Saint itself, the integration program, that's the, that's the important thing. Uh, you will have to set this up manually. Sort of Apex will provide you with a framework, but then you will have to make manual changes and you can handle um, composite structures too. Those composite structures, they also cause satellites and mayhem. Um, they mayhem. are even, even more difficult in my opinion, and typically I walk away and pretend I didn't, yeah. didn't listen to what you just asked. So I mean, when I hear composites, now I, from the materials, I'm a materials engineer, uh, I think more about like layered structures where we're going to add kind of like I'm going to carbon fiber and then I'm going to add another layer and another layer things. Is this what's happening? Also so composite on an atomic sort level. Of, yeah, yeah. On okay. an, you, you're talking more about two dimensions. Yep. Then think about the same thing in three dimensions. You you basically have two materials that are different and they're interpenetrating and then they mess w with each other and then the messing with each other will then cause satellite okay. reflections okay. too. Yeah. So it's kind of that atomic layer, yep. uh, atomic leveled layered mm -hmm. structure yep. of multiple materials. Okay, so from Kuldeep, uh, Michael, can you elaborate the different steps involved in the structure solution of a modulated structure like generation of HK6 file, INS file, and solution in Giannis 2006, 2020? So um, in this case, everything was pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used that um, HKL6 file I yeah. produced, and then um, when I read this in, you know, although initially I had processed it as monoclinic, it told me the satellites, that's not um, compatible, you know, with a monoclinic space, super space group, so it has to be triclinic. Um, but initially, that's good enough for structure solution. I, you can specify, in, in my case, I used um, a Shell XT, um, what we call intrinsic phasing, 
you can point um, um, Yana to use that software for structure solution, and it, it solved it right away. Mm -hmm. um, you can also uh, solve your average structure, and then in you know in Apex, and then there's import facilities in Yana. Um, Superflip is very powerful um, that comes with um, Yana. So there's also different methods of solving uh, mm -hmm. the structure. Sometimes it's a little more tricky. In this case, it was very straightforward. So uh, maybe excuse my ignorance on this. What is Yana? I keep hearing Yana. So what Yana, is Yana is the program that produced the nice dancing molecule. It's okay. written by uh, Václav Petrček um, and um, Michael Dusek in uh, in Prague. Um, it's it's a very sophisticated program. It's the only program I think that can do modulated structures. It can also do um, regular structure refinement, but you would be uh, sort of crazy if you would use that for regular <laughs> structure because it's not very comfortable okay. to use. Okay. It's very difficult to use. It's yeah. just like a niche, super powerful. You know, that's that's it's like yep. you and I. We don't want to uh, sit in a in an F one uh, race car. We yeah. could just wreck yeah. it. And that's often what you do when you don't have much experience. Okay, and so people, if they're interested in this, you can get that from... Yeah, you it's just... It's free online. Yeah. Okay, so like yana.com or something? Or? Uh, I don't know what it is, but you just you search just for yana in. 2020 and or then... Uh, yana the, crystallography. J-A-N-A. -A, yep. Yes. Crystallography. You'll, yeah, you'll find yeah. it. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, next question. Uh, also from Kaldeep. As no video is available, which covers... Oh, I think that's... What is the difference between commensurate and incommensurate? So um, let's let's say we had a modulation, just a, um, um, a modulation, and our Q vector would be 0.25. Yep. That's a quarter, so that's commensurate. Okay. So that's a rational. All right. So then you probably get really away with just treating this as a superstructure. Okay, so if it's something that doesn't divide into one. Then it's incommensurate. Then it's incommensurate. So like 0.291 mm -hmm. or 0.3. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But 0.33332333. Three, 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 three. Yes. That would be. That's pretty darn close. It's, yeah. it's not close. quite a third, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> you could probably get away with a super cell on that. All right. One. Next question from Kelsey. Can I have a free license? Yes, you, you can. You can have a demo license, <laughs> yes. Reach out and um, we can get you a demo license. Of Apex. Of Apex. Y Yana, Apex. that's, yes. that's yeah. the other people's baby. Okay. Uh, from Shao. Can I have you share some incommensurate data? Yes. And yeah. I, I said I will right, do this. About that. And then, um, yeah. All right. From Maya, we had, can you do a demo of Yana with this example? So we kind of showed the result, but I don't think we have the time to. We don't have the time. Yeah. And it probably would be more like a, a webinar. OK. And um, I would have to practice a lot to make this look very smooth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it's about go being real, right? And, and Sure. You know, things aren't always smooth, right? Like you said, driving an F1 car, uh, I don't know, I guess I don't drive one. So. <laughs> uh, but it's, I drive a Chevy, and that is pretty smooth, so mm -hmm. I'd recommend one. <laughs> but that's not an official endorsement by Rupert. <laughs> but, uh, but an F1 car, I can imagine that's not so smooth, and that's okay, right? Because that's what we show people. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so from Peter, what radiation do you recommend for this? We touched on that a little bit. Yeah, um, the first thing I would say is that depends on the materials that you're working with. So if you're working on really light atoms versus working with heavy inner metallics, F elements, huh. then I would say, you know, focus more on what your chemistry, your materials need. But um, if you have those spots, those satellite reflections that are really close and you need to separate them, then I would go with um, a copper because then you've got a little bit more of a spread of those reflections in your images. So in this case, I collected this with Molly and with copper and there's basically no difference. Mm -hmm. So is there a benefit to using like a duo system where you have access to both radiation? Yes. Absolutely there is, yes. Yep. It's always a good idea. Yeah, no, yeah. No, I, I mean, this is, this, is, this is what I said uh, before. With these kind of compounds, you, you yeah. spend quality time and you, you might try a lot of things. You know, I collect this at room temperature, low temperature, Molly, copper, just to see. In this case, it didn't really make a, a, any any difference at all. In other cases, it would matter. Yep. Yep. So, if if I was thinking about, I want to use like the best system I can find, right? Would it be better to use a duo system with those two radiations, or to use say a metal jet? It depends on your materials. Um, if you have 
Um, <clears throat> most of the time, I would say a dual system is best. Um, in very specific cases, will you need the metal jet? Do you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, if you have proteins that just do not defect to, to a high resolution and you need, for the long unit cells, you need um, gallium, you need a longer wavelength. But then if you look at a, you know, at a uranium intermetallic that's modulated, you don't want to use copper or no. um, gallium because you get too much um, absorption. And mm -hmm. you, don't, you, you really want to minimize other effects that can um, you know, minimize your data quality. What about silver? Does, is that just too high and that'll condense these satellites too close to everything? Again, if, if, you, if you have an inter- It all depends. <laughs> with you, the uranium, yeah. then I would have said absolutely go with silver. That's the best choice. Yeah. Um, and often these intermetallics have small unit cells. You know, yeah, okay. if, you, if you have a small unit cell, it's like 555 five, five, if it's cubic, and then you have a, a Q vector that's, that's like 0.31, yeah. no problem. If your Q vector is like 0 0.002, then you would not be able to resolve this. Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't even see this. Okay, and in that case, then you could just say, uh, take that detector, push it farther back, yep. get better yeah. separation, mm -hmm. yes. things like that. Okay. Um, and then, uh, last question I had come in before from Lauren, how do you decouple thermal vibration from the modulation? So do you actually have to like do a step in the software in order to take out the thermal vibrations before you calculate this modulation, or? No, and this is where low temp comes in. Okay. You know. Just solve the problem before it's a problem. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, one more question came in from Susie. Uh, hi, Michael. Greetings from your sister. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really my sister? <laughs> so, uh, uh, but Cole Deep, by the way, he does a request, officially requesting for a tutorial webinar in Apex 5 Yana. Okay. So there you go. So we'll we, do it. Yeah, yep. yeah. Take that up the chain, and That's we've fine. got the official request. Come on. Okay. Uh, so with that, thank you for joining us. It was very, very thank informative. You. I think everybody out there really uh, learned a lot. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, for having us. Yeah, and we'll, hopefully we'll have you back on next season. Season so. four. Yes. That's right, season four. This was the last episode of season three. Um, so next uh, month will be dark when we're making the switch over the set and everything like that, and then we'll be back in March. Um, so thanks to out there to everybody for joining and uh, listening in. Um, and with that, go ahead and keep your signal high and your background low. <laughs>